need support staff to clear the room. Stand up and walk now. Hello and welcome to The Watch. My name is Chris Ryan. I am an editor at TheRinger.com and joining me on the other line, as always, it's Andy Greenwald. Hey, buddy. How are you doing today? <laughs> I'm doing great. Uh, today, kind of a, a weird... Weird grab bag of an episode, obviously, with so much happening in the world, uh, it's hard to concentrate on TV and pop culture, but Andy and I will talk a little bit about both, all of it happening on The Watch coming up next. This episode is brought to you by Anytime Fitness. We may talk a whole lot about sports, but when it comes to keeping fit ourselves, there's definitely room for improvement. I hit this point early July. I was just like, I am not in good enough shape. I started trying to walk at least 15,000 steps a day or hiking or just anything to keep my legs moving. Now it's the end of 2023, I feel great. I had a physical uh, three weeks ago and the guy was like, you're doing great. You're doing better than you were three years ago. I felt great. Whatever your goals are, progress is possible. Thanks to Anytime Fitness. Get a personalized plan and support from an expert coach anytime, anywhere. Visit anytimefitness.com to try Anytime Fitness for free. Start to train for your life. Terms, conditions, and restrictions apply. See website for details. This episode is brought to you by State Farm. From your morning podcast to your afternoon playlist, State Farm knows you personalize your entire day. And that's why State Farm helps you personalize your insurance with the State Farm Personal Price Plan. It offers coverage options that help protect what you care about most at an affordable price just for you. Like a good neighbor, State Farm is there. Prices vary by state. Options selected by customer. Availability and eligibility may vary. All right, man, what's going on? It's Thursday. I don't know about you, but I watched probably like 13 hours of television yesterday cumulatively. Unbelievable. Worst West Wing season ever. But none of it, obviously, TV that we would usually talk about on this program. We don't, we're not really a news program. We're not really a current events program, all, all jokes aside. But it's sort of strange because I think even a day like yesterday winds up kind of just sucking up everything around it. It's just like a vacuum and, and you can't really escape it. So it would be weird. I don't, we're not acknowledging it in so much as like we're like, obviously, like we're appalled at what happened and like, you know, like everything that you would expect us to say, but it does sort of throw a wrench in the works of doing like a fun loving pop culture podcast. Yeah, I would say that I, of all the things I expected to be doing uh, yesterday, doom scrolling in insurrection against the United States of America while observing my younger daughter on a otherwise abandoned COVID unfriendly playground near a freeway. <laughs> you know, I, I didn't have that in life bingo. <laughs> That's a real like Fury Road portrait. <laughs> it kind of was. And like, you know, because playgrounds are are open here, thankfully, but, you know, because of the complete and total catastrophic failure of every aspect of this country in response to the pandemic, both federal and local, the parks are, you know, the, the parks are basically where people are just living and yeah. people have to live somewhere and no one's taking care of them. I get it. But this particular park, which is has like a freeway on one side and then like three trailers with a combination of don't tread on me, but anti-communist and anti-Nazi flags hanging. It's really threatening. On the other side. Yeah. Yeah. I was like, this is a very difficult thing to parse today, (laughs) sir. You know what I mean? (laughs) Like, like you like you might want to get your messaging a little bit straighter. Did you just Um, like knock on the door and be like, can I show you something on Twitter? Can you just bring something down from here? Like, I, I. Exactly. I don't want to alarm you, sir, but Dave Wasserman <laughs> spoke to to uh, yeah. Anyway, no, it was a nightmare. It, no, it, I mean because like it, so. It this is nightmare. the deal. Like you spend your you know usually what happens is Andy and I kind of like have a text message thread where we're deciding what we're going to watch, we're deciding what we're going to talk about, and then naturally some stuff will come up on deadline or whatever you know, the trades that will spark our interest and spark a conversation between the two of us. But I would say that it's no, I'm not. I, I, it's it's not an understatement to say that I was essentially watching TV from Tuesday at about three o'clock until last night at about twelve thirty, flipping between news channels, looking at Twitter, going to C-SPAN. Even I got a note for for my guys over at C-SPAN. Okay, mm. you don't have to. I, I'm not expecting it to look like Carrie Fukunaga is on the 
is on the lenses, but we could go for a couple more angles, right? Like, can we afford that as a, as a nation, as a society? Can I get a couple reaction shots going? Do you like a little camera movement? Is that no, but that's it, like it's just a static. It's a it's a shot at the dais, and then there's like a shot at the Chris. two sides. And I I want to get a little bit of handheld going in there. Chris, I I I got to be straight with you. I think the guys at C-SPAN who are big Paul Greengrass fans wisely took the day off yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> I, I I mean I I appreciate your love of the medium. <laughs> But you want guys, you you want Peter Berg on the rotunda floor shooting Friday Night Lights <laughs> season three? Like, I'm okay with just like flip the switch, camera on, camera off. You know what I mean? <laughs> just put a nanny cam behind uh, Roy Thune and just call it a day. Roy Thune? Is that like your, it's John Thune, but is Roy oh, John Thune, Thune, Thune like, that's like your amalgamation Republican senator is calling him Roy Thune? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it literally could be. Yeah, he's from uh, the great state of South Kansas. Um, <laughs> I have a lot of respect for the flyover country. No, uh, I guess my question for you, because I don't know, if, I don't know if this will come as a surprise or not as a surprise. I have definitely become someone who, despite my previous career, my current career, even my podcasting career, I do not turn on the television very often. Yeah. I do not go to the television in times of news, basically. And I'll say that the, the transition from Tuesday night to Wednesday, in addition to being from like just joy and delight to horror, I, I'm curious about the role television played in this. Mm -hmm. Because I did, you know, for, for all sorts of unrelated to this conversation reasons, like I was kind of inoculating myself from the uh, Georgia runoffs. I did not get too high, did not get too low. I appreciated the emails from our friend John Ossoff, but I can't say I <laughs> responded to many of them. I was even, uh, Amy McGee was still jumping in the inbox, just encouraging me to participate. I feel like Amy McGee needs to take, it, take a seat. You know what I mean? Like take a very, very expensive seat because she could afford it. So my approach to it was very different from past elections, which you know I have not handled super well. No, I was on a, I, on a mental riding health level. shotgun with you on on the presidential election night in text was, was eye opening. In the scheme of Fury Road analogies, I was the blood bag <laughs> that, that <laughs> night. Um, but this night, you know, I was just kind of taking it easy, having dinner with the family, glancing at Dave Wasserman, and Dave Wasserman was like, "This is pretty much a wrap. Like everything's yeah. great." Yeah. And I was like, "Okay, fantastic." Our other friend. Matt, who is a devoted MSNBC watcher, was texting me like, oh shit, Purdue's closing. Like he was, he was following a different drama than I was. And when I finally did put the kids to bed, turned on the TV to see what was up, the disconnect between a sort of calm, methodical, numbers-based reality mm -hmm. and the made-for-television Steve Kornacki is sweating through his third Oxford version of it was really striking. That made me feel like the television, maybe this television thing has gone a little far. Like, you know, I, it made me feel like I, as others and more savvier critics and, and angrier critics have, been like, have, have weighed in against television news. I don't need to join that fray. But then you get a day like yesterday, which for, for good or ill, I guess you kind of have to be watching, right? These are very different. These are very different services that the television is providing. I think we're at a little bit of a, an obvious crossroads in terms of... I'm not sure that, so sure there's like a right way to bear witness to important events anymore because the thing that I was noticing yesterday when I was you know manically refreshing Twitter was the a chronological like nonlinear way in which it was happening because if you give your your central timeline which for me is largely NBA and movie Twitter. And then I would go to different journalists, some of whom were on the scene, some By the of way, whom... Wo Woj was right. Woj was on this before <laughs> anyone, let alone Shams. You know what yeah. I mean? Yeah. He, he knew who Holly was. But I was finding it difficult to kind of uh, organize kind of like the actual who, what, when, where, why, and, and most importantly, when, like how and what order things were sort of happening. So then I kind of went to television after a little while. I think after they had sort of... I mean, to some extent, they, they had retaken the Capitol, which is an insane thing that I have to say in 2021. Um, well, it, it, if you're not on a rewatchables about a Gerard Butler movie. That's right. But I uh, I fired up cable news 
And you know, where, I don't know where about were you. you? O- o- OAN, Newsmax. What's your what's your go to? No, I was I was flipping between CNN and MBC, MSNBC. Yeah. But even so, I still ended the day with dental implants uh, and refinancing my home four times. And by the way, I don't own a home. I just I just kept refinancing it. <laughs> can, can, can I also add? Um, the ads that they have on those things where it's like, this is the most important thing that's happened in 20 years. Yes. And then it's like, here's a guy in Fresno who will give you uh, plastic teeth is the, Listen, is the I, commercial. Chris, I used to watch a lot of Food Network and Cooking Channel. And yeah. I would be enjoying some like Canadian show about a guy named... I, I, I was like, I feel like some guy named Rocco was his name. And he's just like, this is my Italy. You know, it, it was filmed <laughs> in like 2004 and it was like not HD. Yeah. And I was loving it. And then it would cut to commercial and it would just be like Jeopardy font, white letters on the screen being like, do you need a new catheter? We have <laughs> catheters. Didn't say if they were new or used, but I was like, okay, so this is my demographic. And I thought that was as gnarly as it would get. But then I was watching MSNBC the other night with the, as I was saying, with the Georgia runoffs. And they just kept running an ad for medication that will stop your heart stopping. Okay. <laughs> it was medication you can take against chronic heart failure. Was it heart stop stop? Was that what it's Wait. called? <laughs> Listen, you're the branding consultant. You're the expert. <laughs> just throwing things against the, the wall here. The images were of hale and hearty middle-aged men. Yeah. Not like us. Like we're talking the silverest of silver foxes. Right. Um, deep sea diving, oh. which I wouldn't do with a perfectly healthy ticker, but you do you. And then it says the list of, you know, if you have high blood pressure, maybe you shouldn't be taking heart stop stops. If you uh, have if you've got heart scalp, problems, do not take heart be stop stop. It. Yeah. And then it said, and I'm I, I'm paraphrasing. In rare and certain cases, this medication may cause a potentially fatal rash to emerge on your perineum. And then in letters on the screen, it said, your perineum is is located between your anus and your genitals. Mm -hmm. And at this point, I'm just running the numbers. I've kind of lost the thread here. When did you see this advertisement? Right before they NBC declared Reverend Raphael Warnock the winner of the Oh, I thought this was like back when you were watching Rocco's Rocco's trip to Italy. Chris, (laughs) this this is a podcast about this moment right now, this American moment. And it did make me wonder, how bad would my heart failure have to be <laughs> to run the risk of a fatal fungal infection in the most private area okay, of the Gary human body? Bradshaw. <laughs> I like, couldn't help but wonder. <laughs> right? Yeah. You know what I mean? If it was like male pattern baldness medication, like, okay, you know, maybe you don't need to take the pills. But if it's a pill that will stop your heart stopping. Yeah, right. Do you sacrifice rashes? The taint. I'm just asking. Okay, I, mean, I got the, a little off base. That's definitely the big question I think everybody is asking coming <laughs> yes. out of, of yesterday. Um, Speaking of the taint, Senators Cruz, Hawley, and please go on. No, you know, so like I, I, was, I was up late. I figured it was one of those things that was so funny because I, I don't know if you're like this, but I often uh, have a hard time hitting the eject button on things because I have decided that the amount that I've invested into something needs to be repaid in some way. So you're great in Vegas. So <laughs> that's why. <laughs> that's why I you always, don't own a home, Chris. I, that's, that's why, why you I keep, refinancing. keep refinancing. But I, at a certain point, at like nine thirty or something like that, right? Uh, my wife and I were like, you know, maybe we should just go watch something else, or just like go read, or turn this off. And I'm sure we'll be alerted if something happens. But I was like, I can't, I can't let go because they were doing a really good job being like, any minute now, Nancy Pelosi will do this. And then Mike Pence will do this, and then this will happen. And it's, it, it kind of gets into the, um, in, into what you're talking about with like, te- like, cable news owning a moment and making mm-hmm. it into television rather than making it into documentation. If you watch, and, and no disrespect to the Denis Villeneuve's of C-SPAN, who obviously were sheltering in place and could not, aff- and not do boom shots or anything, but if you just watch C-SPAN and you watch all these knuckleheads give their speeches, you know, like you're just kind of like okay, I'm going through the process of what our version of democracy is supposed to be. But if you were watching MSNBC, at a certain point, I think after like, you know, Ben Sass talked, they were just like, we're just going to have talking heads talking over the talking heads. And we're just going to try and like kind of 
continue to develop like these narratives while we're waiting for some sort of finality. Like there was an impatience with the process that I thought was really interesting that I am, I, I personally like definitely fell victim to because I would go to C-SPAN and I'd be like, I don't really want to watch this fucking guy from Pennsylvania talk. So I would go back and watch Ali Valeshi be like, this was a coup and this is like this. And, and, and I, I it was like, you get sucked into the sort of, Real time Monday morning quarterbacking of something rather than watching like something play out. Well, I think the two really significant terms you just used are impatience with the process and narrative. And I think one of the, this might be glib and this might be sort of stitched together on the fly, but I think that one of the major problems of our era and clearly, clearly <laughs> for the world is the fact that everything has to be narrative and we are incredibly impatient mm -hmm. as a people and i'm not saying that's because of the rise of prestige television or whatever i'm not trying to draw some bullshit equivalency here but you know the, the investing time in like a sporting event it's a contained thing where the odds are you know, the outcome is uncertain and so that mm -hmm. feels you know exciting the potential collapse of American democracy, outcome also uncertain, right? But the desire to latch on to narrative that this was all the way this, this is who is, this is who is to blame. This is the only response. This is what's going to happen next is really just, you know, human beings casting out against the darkness of uncertainty and desperate to have some path. Right. And that's not going to work. You know what I mean? <laughs> like we have to, be mindful of what we can control and what we can't control. And also over the larger, like macro scope of things and buried in here also is just this, the thing that, that I'm, I'm really struggling with today. And I think that, um, Ezra Klein late of late of Vox, surprisingly, not, not of Substack. <laughs> he made, he, he's the guy that went back to old media, which I respect had his first column in the New York times. It was basically like, uh, Everyone who did this yesterday was lied to. And we, at some point in the last four years, and I think there were many, many smart people on the parapets basically saying, like, words do matter. Reality mm -hmm. is reality. You know, you can't just br brush this under the rug. But lying constantly to people has consequences. And, you know, and, and I'm not just, everyone is complicit in this to, to some degree because in order to survive the last four years. And, 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 and I should say that as someone whose life was never in danger, you know what I mean? Like sure. could not be coming from a more fortunate or privileged or secure place, but even just mentally to engage with things in order to do a podcast with you about, you know, chicken marinades or, or whatever. I forget what else we talk about. Um, I have to compartmentalize yeah, and be like, when he says I actually won in a landslide, I can't, I can't think about that. I can't think about the fact that he is saying something so wildly, um, disrespectfully, uh, you know, I'm trying to come up with an, a, a, he's uh, lying. Trying to make, he's, he, yeah, he's, he's just lying. He's lying to so millions of people. Fundamentally yeah. untrue and people believe it. Yeah. And so it, it's a, it's a strange place to be, to be in this completely untethered world where we all kind of still want gatekeepers and narrative and handholding. And yet we've given all that away. Yeah, and I I think there's also like a feeling that in the in our own lifetimes, especially over the last five years, but I think you know in the in in the advent of the internet and all that, like we have witnessed the death of those the idea of being able to like stand up and be counted. Like that was the thing that struck me yesterday, watching the Senate speeches is like all these guys, both Republicans and Democrats, doing these really ornate Aaron Sorkin imitations, you know, yeah. talking about Thomas Paine and things that happened in the 18th century or 19th century. And, and like, I'm just sitting there and just being like, do you guys think this makes a fucking difference to anybody hearing this? Like, do you think that anybody is like deeply moved by like your contextualization of this? Like there's something about like, you can't, you, nobody is buying, have you no decency, sir, anymore. You know, like that, that moment of like, well, he's lost Walter Cronkite is it, that was something I really, really felt yesterday was like, yeah. none, none of this shit matters. Like, no, no, these people who did this 
are fully convinced either for for lols or because they're literally fucking believe that like the country is run by satanic pedophiles that, that this was what they should do and they're fucking nuts you know what i mean like but but i mean the ted cruz and josh hawley who went to ivy league schools know what they're doing and I think one of the things that'll be the more one of the more interesting reckonings is they never actually wanted to go near those people that tried to run them down in the rotunda yesterday. They never want to talk to them. They don't believe what they're telling those people. They want to use them and, you know, fundraise off of them and get attention and votes and power off of them. And then they came crashing through the front fucking door. Yeah. You know, the, the best this might seem trite but if the this is fine dog was the meme <laughs> of this era the me reaping me sowing yeah tweet should just go in the smithsonian for the and for people who aren't familiar with it it's the me me reaping fuck yeah haha <laughs> this is great me sowing what the fuck this sucks <laughs> right that's it that's where we're at. And it, it's just so, this sucks. Yeah. This I don't, I, I wish sucks. I had some like words of wisdom, you know, uh, I, my, I, my brain feels pretty hollowed out. I think that especially since early November, you feel like, I, I don't know about you, but I just feel like I've been hooked up to a, a push strip of, of social media and news media and reading about this stuff. And, you know, I'm, I'm very hopeful that, 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 this is the end of something and not the beginning of something. I, I don't know what to think anymore in that regard. But like you said, like it's a human, we have a human desire to compartmentalize, to not have this like take over our entire, our entire minds and all of our lives. And I guess what we can do in the second half of this podcast is chat about some random other stuff. We have some Star Wars news. You and I wanted to like kind of bounce a couple of ideas and we have our, we have our Facebook groups top 10 of 2020 that we wanted to discuss. Yeah, I mean, I guess, and and I and I look forward to getting into that stuff just to, to to lighten our minds, and I'm sure lighten the minds of our listeners too. But if there's any kernel of positivity that I'm trying to draw from, it, it is like, you know, we we've all just been gaslit and lied to collectively for four years or more that the sky isn't falling, that everything's fine. The stock market is whatever. He's an ordinary Republican. The, the institutions will hold. People can constrain him, you know. And there are large swaths of the country for, for whom that has never been true, mm -hmm. you know. And uh, if anything, what yesterday seemed to represent, and, and it's pathetic that it took this long and that it comes so close to the end. And I, I really like the, was it John Lovett from Crooked Media who tweeted like resigning now is like quitting the bank job in the last half hour of heist. You're not actually against bank robbery. You just don't like that it went south. Yeah. But it did seem to be a moment when suddenly everyone realized that the room is on fire. And though you are a dog and that coffee tasted pretty good, it was not fine. Right. You know, and, and I hope that we can take that and not just pretend not just memory hold this as some freak occurrence, you know? Yeah. It's, it, it's something that no, 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 I was, I was having a hard this. time with that yesterday, man. Like I was having a hard time with like seeing what you saw earlier in the day and then, you know, admirably getting back to work, but like having Congress just be like, you know, the work goes on. Here we go. Like, we're just going to kind of push through. Like, I, I don't know. I just, something felt cognitive, cognitively dissonant about that yesterday. Was it also the fact that you can't leave your home because 4,000 <laughs> Americans died of a virus that none Probably of those people are talking about? That. Yeah. So here we are. All right. We're going to take a quick break. And when we come back, we will talk about some, some pop culture stuff. This episode is brought to you by Mint Mobile. New Year's resolutions are fun the first couple of weeks. Then you kind of maybe conveniently forget about them halfway through January. No shame. It happens to us all. But this year, I have a foolproof plan, at least when it comes to saving money. Just switch to Mint Mobile and you're done. Goal accomplished because for a limited time, their wireless plans are 15 bucks a month when you buy a three month plan. The great thing about Mint Mobile is there's no jaw dropping monthly bills or unexpected overages, and all plans come with unlimited talk and text. Get this new customer offer today at mintmobile.com slash watch. Additional taxes, fees, and restrictions apply. See Mint Mobile for details.
All right, man, we're back. Uh, so the first half of the show is obviously us sort of trying to sort through our thoughts about everything that was happening in the country over the last 24 or 48 hours. Uh, we still want to be, uh, we also want to provide a little bit of a distraction for people if they want that. So I guess we can just chat about some pop culture stuff. I don't think we can fully divorce it from you know the context of where our heads are at. And to that and I will say that the only pop culture I uh, watched other than the news yesterday was the episode of Friends where Chandler and Joey find free porn. <laughs> I don't know if you remember that episode. I don't. Can I be honest with you? Like we should, you know, it's time to just finally like be real in this podcast. I don't remember a single episode of Friends. Really? Maybe the one where they swapped apartments. Yeah, that's, so sort of that's like a mind. whole, they have like, the, there's like a bet and then they like swap apartments and it's like oh, a whole and, season. And, and when Monica and Chandler are in bed together. Sorry, spoilers. I yes, remember that because right. that was right. a big moment. I don't remember anything else. Did you watch Friends a lot? Absolutely. Obsessive. Absolutely. Like, yeah. Oh, yeah. I, I find mean, that maybe, I, I'm, maybe not the later seasons. Right. Maybe. Well, in any case, I would just say that, that like that was the, the episode of Friends that was like next in the HBO Max queue was that one. And uh, it was definitely like, it was definitely like a relief to watch something else than, than uh, you know Chris Hayes and Rachel Maddow. But it was it was definitely not about what what the day was about. Can you imagine like you know this would be if we were still maybe you should do this, have someone do this for the Ringer. But like watch your continued watching queue on HBO Max. It would be the most schizophrenic experience. Like up next, episode six of I May Destroy You, episode two of Chernobyl. Episode one hundred and seventy fucking seven of the Big Bang Theory. Yeah, you know what I mean. Like that is a very strange assortment. I wonder what would happen if you were able to feed all of your streaming services into some sort of randomizer, but mm. you know, only the shows that you're actually like watching. So that not like you would have to like you would randomly get some like cartel and kind of docudrama or something. You would but, be like, thrilled. I would be fine with that, but. Like, I wonder if there would be like an app to like just basically spit that out where it would be like, here's a Friends episode. Here's an episode of Bridgerton. Here's an episode of The Wilds. Here's what you are watching these days. But if you don't want to choose this thing, we'll just like do it. I mean, I guess you could just like press the button. I don't know why you're giving this away for free. I feel like Jeffrey Somebody's Katzenberg thought, I mean, like Netflix has done randomizer tech before, I think, on their service. Like, I think you can do that. Um, Netflix has done randomizer tech on their series orders as well. <laughs> so I feel like that's baked in. Uh, yeah, Apple the the Apple TV app could do that because it if you, if you use the Apple TV to watch shows or to like as your hub, you click on that and it's like here are the things you've been watching. Yeah, but you know what I do is uh, whenever it's like Apple TV wants like to access your your you say like. No? Yeah, I always do. I don't know why. Do you, feel, do you feel like momentarily powerful? Yeah, I'm just like, no way. <laughs> like, do you feel like Glenn Greenwald? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. In that moment? Yeah. Are you are you sticking it to big media? Well, there was like two weeks there when I think the EU passed whatever law about like cookies management, where it was just like every website you would go to would ask you like these 37 yeah. questions about whether or not you want your... And I By was way, like very Chris, diligent about that for like 10 days. It was the EU. So there was actually biscuit management. Right. That's right. That's right. But I was pretty diligent about it for a little while. And then I was like, you know what? I, life's too short. I'm just going to say accept all cookies. <laughs> just accept all. By the way, I feel like While that I'm is looking a, at this Cayman Islands sports gambling site. <laughs> that is a really good motto for 2020. 2020, accept all cookies. That's how I wind up starring in the sequel to The Laundromat. <laughs> you, you, like, understand, you understand that I'm going to go on Instagram later today and all the ads are going to be for uh, congestive heart failure medication. <laughs> Definitely. So there's two things we wanted to do. One is that you wanted to try and convince me to get into something that you're into, right? Yeah. And right. then I also thought for S's and G's, we could talk about um, the little bit of Star Wars news that came out today, uh, quite okay. as kept. So why don't we do the Star Wars stuff first? I, I just wanted to mention this because every once in a while in Hollywood, you just see somebody really just pops and they wind up becoming such a hot property. And the person who's like kind of like the, the taste du jour right now seems to be this guy, Michael Waldron, who I thought we should talk about briefly. So this is a guy, a dude who is um, show running Loki for Marvel and, and, and the, the gods up at Disney Plus. And he was just tapped to write Kevin Feige's Star Wars movie, which had gone relatively unremarked upon during the Star Wars announcements that we covered a couple of weeks ago. I think the only feature that was talked about, well, it was Taika Waititi's feature was in development and that Patty Jenkins was going to be 
directing essentially a fighter pilot movie called Rangers. Is it, the- is it a movie where fighter pilots fly from Washington, D.C. to Cairo without refueling? <laughs> She's directing a movie called Rogue Squadron, which I, uh-huh. I Dollars to Donuts is going to have like a Wedge, Wedge Antilles cameo. But we hadn't really heard about the Feige thing. And um, we like heard a, it was announced, but we didn't yeah, know but we what had, it was. Nobody had said anything since then about like whether this was a signal that he was going to have a bigger role at Lucasfilm and whether or not he would start overseeing maybe the feature film development of that arm of place or whether he would have any larger role. And for, and also just like, what's his, what's the story he wants to tell? You know, is, is he going to do a post sequel story? Is he going to do another Canon anthology story? It's really, it is really noteworthy. I mean, in, in the scheme of things, it's not normal, even in this, new abnormal of how you make franchise movie making to just gift a film to a producer. You know what I mean? Like generally yeah. it's all under the auspices of the person running it, whether it's Feige with Marvel or Kathy Kennedy with, with, with star Wars and you know, writer producers, director producers. Sure. But like a producer is odd. And so the assumption that I think we shared when we casually talked about this was that was this Alan Horn or was this Bob Iger, Bob Chapek being like, we're not really sure about how this is going. So we're going to just skim a little bit off the top and give it to our most successful moneymaker, potentially with the I- implication buried in there that they might just give this all to him too. Sure. Right. And put him in over Kathy Kennedy. The idea that he just might want to tell a little story, you know, about a galactic something or other didn't really figure into it. He's so good at world building and he makes very different types of movies within the Marvel umbrella that the idea that he just might have a passion project about a young Padawan named Kevin. I don't know. Like, <laughs> is, is Kevin this? the guy at the end of the Ryan Johnson movie with the broom? Uh, honestly, I was what I was thinking. Yeah, it was. But, but, but it was like Game of Thrones, Kevin. Remember where they ran out of names? Oh, yeah. Kevin like, Lannister. Kavan. Or it's like Kavan. It's, yeah. Ka- it's Kevin. But uh, Michael Waldron, so he is writing the uh, Doctor Strange sequel that I think is shooting the Sam Raimi movie that is yeah. due out late this year. And I think will be a pretty important movie in terms of whatever this next phase of features is, because uh, it's just based on the, the sort of subtitle of it in the multiverse of madness. And guys, and- Rachel McAdams is in it. Remember when that was a headline? Like, relax, fellas. Do you think Brat's back for this? Well, we haven't even talked about that. I mean, do you think? How do you think Pangborn feels about the red hot New York Knicks? I think he feels mixed about it because, first of all, he's waited years to have a coach like Tibbs. You yeah. know what I mean? And, and yeah. to see them just like play a, with a hustle again, nose defense first coach. Yeah. yeah, and to like play like it matters, and to respect the shield in the middle of the Garden floor, <laughs> all of that matters to him. On the downside, Dolan still owns the team, mm-hmm. and at the end of the first Doctor Strange film, his ability to walk was taken away <laughs> by. <laughs> Mordo or Mordu. I don't even remember anymore. So I would say, is Pangborn a glass half full kind of guy? I, I'd like to think so. Yeah. I mean, for him, do you think he looks at Julius Randall? He's like, great. He's playing for a contract. It's not going to be with us. So what, what's, what's the point? You know, or is he like, this guy's an all star. We have an all star New York Nick now. I think that he feels like the Randall thing is fleeting, but I think that his spirits raised when Taj Gibson resigned because i think that he considers himself in his in his rucker prime a taj gibson like force gotcha Gotcha. you know what i mean yeah well just a little bit of background on waldron so obviously he's writing that dr doom sequel a dr strange sequel and he has an overall deal at disney which this star wars movie appears to be a part of and it was mentioned in this deadline piece that announced this deal that he is already or that he is at least tapped to continue to be the showrunner on Loki season two, which I thought was an interesting aside just because one of the things I'm curious about with Falcon and the Winter Soldier and uh, Hawkeye, Miss Marvel, Loki, uh, even WandaVision is to what extent they are planning on multiple seasons. Because obviously, like a lot of these people uh, were kind of in line for pretty significant. I mean, I just like when you think about like Sebastian Stan and Anthony Mackie, I'm sure when they were making those movies, uh, those Captain America movies, they were probably like, and then like we maybe we make our own movies, right? Like we, we we're going to keep doing this. And now we're talking about season two of Loki. And I would imagine multiple seasons of these other Marvel shows. Here's what I would, would I, here's what I would say. And if, if I were Kevin Feige, here's what I would do. 
retire to an island with all my money. <laughs> but in this particular circumstance, what I would do is confirm nothing and deny nothing. Like this is the guy who invented the modern star studio contract slash relationship. Mm -hmm. The rotating door of bromance and fun that is Marvel Studios in Atlanta, uh, I am sure is part of the pitch for these TV series. And what that means is things we've discussed in the past, like it's not as big a time commitment as you think. Mm -hmm. uh, you can show up, you can do a little bit of this, a little bit of that, and you're suddenly you're in three shows in a movie and you're on your way. I also think that it probably means that there was some kind of very actor-friendly contract for the TV verse. You know, it's not a movie thing, which was like, you know, for Chris Evans, who is a seven movie deal, but some of those movies were small appearances or, or whatever. It's probably something more innovative and interesting that says you're going to be doing X number of projects for us and we have an option and you have an option. And some of these series absolutely are being designed to be launching pads for future movies. Mm -hmm. Like maybe there won't be another Falcon Winter Soldier season uh, right away because they're going to be the new Avengers or whatever. Who knows? We don't know what it's going to be. But I also imagine there are switches, you know, like optionalities in all these deals that if suddenly something pops, they could do another one. I mean, I, I just think that they should not be yoking themselves to this expectation that there's going to be a season of Loki every year for the next five years. And I'm sure, sure. Tom Hiddleston doesn't want that either. Could sure. there be five seasons total sprinkled in between movies and the night manager part two and part trois? Yeah, sure. I don't know. I don't know what else Hiddleston's got in his dance card. But I think that flexibility makes a lot of sense. Flip side of that, Ms. Marvel and Moon Knight, stuff like that, those feel like TV shows to me. So like, you think Oscar Isaac is going to make like three seasons of Moon Knight? Um, yeah, I do. <laughs> <laughs> Took me a second. Yeah. But yeah, I do. I'm not going to hold mean, you to that. Don't worry about it. <laughs> well, have we ever gone broke overestimating Oscar Isaac's career goals? Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah, that's right. So, um, but 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 the, the Waldron thing is cool. I don't know him at all. We we we've never encountered him. We don't know anything about what he's like. He's got a cool mustache in his press photo. But it he's is got interesting. A, a wrestling show coming on Stars called Heels. He's got a wrestling show on Heels, which is how he first came on my radar, and that was a long time in development, and finally made it to to production on Stars, and is finally coming out. But while in the time it took for him to be like a guy hustling his wrestling show, he just tapped this other vein, and as you said, is now like the golden child of Disney. It's it's cool. It's interesting. Yeah, so uh, we'll keep an eye on that story just because I think it will explain a lot about where where these things are going. And I'm I'm also like very curious to know about the uh, in this moment of of nobody can do anything wrong, the, the the degree to which Marvel and Lucasfilm work together, work uh, in conjunction, whether or not they're keeping things off of each other's corners, uh, how talent gets divided up, and. Also, how stuff gets rolled out. Like, um, I, I'm very curious. You know, they 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 did that entire announcement in one day. Obviously, we did the Star Wars shows first, and then we talked about the Marvel shows second. At some point, given the volume that they're talking about, I would imagine there will be points when on Disney Plus you'll have a Star Wars and a Marvel show on at the same time. One other thing that I would say, one other like um, an implication you could take from the, the Waldron doing a Star Wars movie thing. Other than the Patty Jenkins movie, it does seem like the big lesson from the last five years of Star Wars hits and misses in terms of movies is all caps. We are funny now. Mm -hmm. Taika and Michael Waldron, I'm sure, can write all kinds of genres. But if the Loki trailer is any any guy, it has like a comic, it is. comic caper with a little bit of like psychedelia added in for good measure. Yeah, and and that's and that's noteworthy, and it's particularly noteworthy when you compare it to you know all the criticism we had for Wonder Woman, for example, last week. Uh, what else did you want to talk about? Oh, we should just as a shout out to our our loyal uh, Facebookers, none of whom have had their uh, posting privileges locked yet today by Mark Zuckerberg, who suddenly woke up. Um, they posted their top 10, right? Like didn't, they did a, a survey. I feel like we should shout them out and give their top 10 a moment yeah. in the sun. So the, let's call this what it is, which is the last time we're going to talk about 2020 shows in a, in a real way. Because, you know, I think what happens in January is that you're st we still wind up like chatting about 2020 shows. And then 
it's almost like those shows kind of like start to lose their meaning, but I really did love our Facebook groups list and I wanted to give them a shout out. Uh, this is, I think the second or third year in a row that they've done their own voting on their list. And it's always interesting to see the, the sort of overlap with you and me and, and Kaya and Sam that they have. And then also some places where they deviate. I'll do their top 10. I'll just list it from 10 to one. They had the boys season two at number 10, the crown season four at number nine, Dave at number eight, what we do in the shadows at number seven, normal people at six. I may destroy you at five, the Mandalorian at four, the queen's gambit at three, Ted Lasso at two, which is very on brand for our group. And also speaking about leaders who lie to their followers. Chris. Yes. And, and then uh, Better Call Saul season five uh, was the number one show. So they agreed with your boy, it, CR. It's kind of nice that um, our, our listeners, this is a very watch friendly list. Yeah. Yeah. There's a, there's a bunch of stuff in the second 10 that I thought I would mention that either we didn't talk about a ton or I'm just sort of glad to see on there, but like wish we had chatted about more. So um, I did recaps of Dark, or we we, we, we talked about Dark mm-hmm. Season 3, but Dark, that came in 21st. Um, the Great, which you've mentioned Wait, 20, a bunch of... 21st or 11th? Dark Season 3 came in 21st. What what came between 11 and 20? Didn't you oh, just you name want, 10 I could just name them, yeah. Shit's Creek came in 11th. Uh, Last Dance came in 12th. Good Place came in 13th. I see. High Fidelity, 000, Industry, How To with John Wilson. That's Devs, The Great, Ozark. That's the top 20 there. And then the next batch was Dark, Top Chef, Bojack, Survivor, Lovecraft Country, Mythic Quest, which is a show that I, I, I enjoyed quite a bit, but we didn't get a chance to talk about too much. Gangs of London, which many people have been hitting me up on social media being like, what did you do? Why didn't you put this in your top 10? <laughs> um, yeah, and a bunch of other big mouth Perry Mason, my brilliant friend, Pen15. Never it's have I ever seen Dark so. on there. Yeah. So uh, shout out to our Facebook group. Shout out to their voting. And and um, and it's, yeah, it's just uh, really interesting. It's, it, it's cool to see what these consensus shows are and then what the random ones are that people have thrown in there. Like Zoe's Infinite Playlist that we, I don't think I've, I've seen yet, honestly, um, made in the top 40 here. It's also interesting to me to see shows that... Um, and it makes sense, I think. Shows that rank highly on a collective list like that are shows that maybe didn't appear on our list but got covered on the podcast, like The Boys, for example, a show we both like a lot, but we mm-hmm. also love to have in our lives because it is a big, flashy, uh, thought-provoking, enjoyable popcorn program, right? And it makes for a great conversation, and we can have guests on about it, and it's just a really good show to have as a podcast it was fell outside of my personal top 10 and I think yours as well. And that, and that's, I think that's sort of what makes sense why it's ranks a little higher for them. And, and you know what we do in the shadows, for example, high on my list, but honestly, other than maybe getting a chance to have some of those people on our show in the next year when season three comes on, I don't know how we talk about it. Other yeah. than to be like, yeah, when, when, when Nick Kroll put the hat made out of a <laughs> witch's anus back on his head, that was funny. You know, <laughs> am I going to have to engage with Dave? Is that what this means? Dave's funny. Dave is funny. I think you would enjoy it. Says. Yeah. But you know what? The thing with you, I can never tell. You know, like, know. you also, I think, mm-hmm. I think the rap on you is that ever since Andy started making TV, he's softened because he understands how hard it is and like everything that goes yeah. into it. And like, you got to shout out to the person who makes sure that like, you know, that Andy has an, um, an umbrella protecting him from the sun, you know? Locations department, very important to be nice to them, yeah. But you still come with the the knives out sometimes, man. Like, I'll just be like, oh, did you see this? What'd you think? And you're just like, it was shit. Um, so... <laughs> to be fair, you're talking... There was a movie Chris recently suggested to me. Yes. And I was thrilled to learn it, about its existence. Yes. It seemed right up our alley. And I it remain did. thrilled that it exists because... <laughs> One of the great things about being a cinephile of long standing like myself is there's always more to discover. The fact that you're you know? now identifying as this is just like, I don't know what to do with this information. You being like, I am a letterbox guy now is really yeah. tough for me. I have long championed the motion picture industry. Yeah. Uh, you know, like Pauline Kale, I lost it at the movies, Chris. And, but the point being, Chris suggested something to me and I struggled because immediately, because Chris is, my dear friend, mm-hmm. my wife and I fired it up that night. Yep. And we 
thought it was. Are you, you going to say what it is? We thought it was pretty bad, but I was happy it existed. But then I struggled for 24 hours to let you know about this because you're, 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 you matter to me so much. Your thoughts, your, you know, just the fact that you, you found something lovely in the world and brought it to me. But I also, Chris, unlike the insurrectionist senators in the United States Senate, I won't lie to you. No, you don't. You know? You don't. So it's not like you were like, watch this. And I was like, fuck you. This is garbage. <laughs> no. I just thought it was. Uh, but I think that I, I, you don't amateurish. have. Here's what you don't have. And, I'm, and I don't know whether you need to develop this, this gear mm-hmm. or not. Mm-hmm. But you do not have a, it was pretty good. You, no. You are a very, I either love something or I hate something. And I don't often find you sticking with anything that's like that you don't love mm-hmm. for the most part, unless I make you do it. But <laughs> I, it's rare that you will be like, that had a lot to like, if it, even if it didn't ultimately work. I think my softest, softest praise is admirable. Mm-hmm. I, I, I've been breaking that out a lot, a lot recently. So if you want to scroll through the archives, maybe you'll have a little <laughs> more insight. But Chris, I was employed as a critic for many years. I know. Not just TV, but before that. And the medium take genuinely is the enemy and which isn't to say that i would you know nudge the needle one way or the other but i think that's one of the reasons why i took to it because and one of the reasons why i very happily stand stood down too because there there is something in me as you know that not only doesn't like something like it makes me question the value of human life on earth and makes me want to burn it all down so sometimes i have to take a breath this this wasn't that Let's do our last us. segment, which is, I'm going to let you, you drive this one. Okay, so trying to think of something to talk about on the podcast today that might be uplifting in a, what's the opposite of uplift? Down? down. Depre- depressing. Yeah. yeah. Oh, because it presses down. Yeah, thanks. Good. Good stuff. See, this is why we need each other in our lives. And I was thinking about what has brought me and my family some joy, and yet is something that is generally not able to be brought here to this podcast. And that is the films of uh, the great Japanese animator Hayao Miyazaki and the works of his studio, Studio Ghibli, which I just finally learned how to pronounce. And I'd love to talk to you about that as well. And well, how were you pronouncing it? Well, so as you know, Chris, the word comes from Libyan Arabic. I mean, duh, obviously. <laughs> and was the name of an Italian airplane. And Miyazaki is a big... Uh, fan of air travel was he in italian and in libyan arabic and again i don't it's insulting for me to tell you this to your face because you know this but i assume (laughs) maybe our listeners don't it's pronounced ghibli Uh a hard g this is the the gif gif thing all over again but when it is translated into japanese and spelled out in katakana lettering it's a little bit more like jibri so i'm torn because you know i am I swear, I swear by my fidelity to Libyan Arabic, just as a spoken language. So I want to say Ghibli. Are we losing people in the segment yet? <laughs> I just can't Would tell be. if you're vamping because you're trying to decide how no, you're going to pitch I, this to me. No, no. Here, here's my take. Okay, so these are, I'm not, I, I haven't been on the front lines of the anime revolution, right? I had not actually seen any of these movies. I'd heard how they were adored and beloved and brilliant and Pixar modeled everything they did on the works of the great master Miyazaki. I didn't see any of them until I had kids and I also wanted to stop showing them garbage. So I sought out my neighbor Totoro, which is one of his earliest movies and watched it. And like, not only is it absolutely magical and transformative and beautiful, they loved it so much and they loved it in a way that they Your don't family love. Did. Yeah. Shock. Yeah. You know, it really truly is a beautiful and special film. And then, but the only way to get them was you'd have to buy the Blu-rays like at the Japanese bookstore in Little Tokyo. Now they're all on, as we've said before, on HBO Max. Right and next to uh, the one where Chandler and Joey get free porn. Yeah, exactly. Which makes navigating that website a real, real challenge. So my kids are like, we like friends too. You know, <laughs> we like our friends at school. Um, so we were watching them like, because some of them are, appropriate for all ages some of them are trend a little bit more mature i mean still still for kids but for older kids and so we there are a couple that we'd watched and then on new year's eve we wanted to do family movie night and we finally decided to watch spirited away which is considered to be his masterpiece it won the oscar for best animated film in 2001 
uh, and kind of opened the floodgates for appreciation of him in this country and around the world. And I've been told it was maybe a little too old for some, for my kids' ages. But you but hadn't anyway. seen it yet. No. Okay. And we watched it together. And when it was over, my wife, who you think that I have exacting standards, much stronger standards than I do, was like, I think that was maybe the best movie I've ever seen. <laughs> Wait, when and, did you watch it? Uh, New Year's Eve, before the champagne came out. Okay. Uh, for for bona fides, like when A.O. Scott and Manola Dargis did their best movies of the century so far, it was number two. Yeah, I, I, I know that it's, it's, well, it's well respected. So they are so beautiful and inspiring and like really make you come alive because the approach to storytelling is just so not the box that all of our stories are in. Watching Spirited Away, it's not just from a kid's movie perspective. It's from a, I, we watched Soul the day before, the new Pixar movie, which is really admirable. And, and there I used it, see? That was my soft praise. It's kind of amazing and beautiful in a lot of ways, but it's also the same Pixar bullshit, right? Where mm-hmm. the problem goes in the machine and there's some thoughtfulness and then the problem comes out of the machine. It's so rigid in its storytelling uh, language. And then you watch Spirited Away and there is a stink spirit in a bathhouse of the of the spiritual world, you know, getting like herbal tonics and dropping gold and also an emetic dumpling as a gift for the young girl, which is a small piece of river spirit material that makes you vomit impurities. Okay. This is in a kid's movie. So it is a tonic to watch these movies. And I feel like you need to come on board. So I'm going to present you. Chris, with four options. Pick okay. your poison. Pick your own emetic dumpling. Uh huh. And then we got to talk about what it made you feel and what it did to your storytelling brain. So you want me to watch? You one have a choice. I'm gonna, I'm, I'm gonna. Okay. Yes. I'm gonna pitch. Right. I'm gonna pitch them to you, and you tell me which one tickles Sounds your good. fancy. Because right. famously, you're not the biggest animated guy. Right. Okay. So choice number one, the first one that my family watched, my neighbor Totoro about two young girls and their father who move to a house in the country while their mother's in a hospital and find enchanted wood spirits live there and occasionally ride around the countryside on a cat bus, which is a bus that is also a cat. Okay? Okay. Two, Kiki's Delivery Service Hmm. about a young witch. I think I used that back in New York. (laughs) You know what I mean? (laughs) Kiki's delivery service runs from 10 p.m. to 4 a.m., but it's never it's Kiki's very hard delivery to find. service always six blocks away. This is, this is the best content we've ever done. About a young witch and her talking cat, voiced yeah. by <laughs> Phil Hartman, not a bus, talking cat, who travels to a new city to find her purpose in life. Okay. Okay. Got it. Three, spirited away. As I discussed, a brilliant and lyrical, savage takedown of capitalism told through. I'm realizing right now that the much better content would have been you saying the title and me guessing what the plot of the movies were. Okay, we can still do that bit. (laughs) Young girl travels into the spirit realm and it's a big bathhouse and her parents turn into pigs. Okay. You're just taking it now. What's the fourth one? The fourth one, perhaps his most adult film. The Wind Rises, okay? okay? And that's his love letter to his main animating forces, which were airplanes and pacifism, about a young guy who designs airplanes in the middle of the century for Japan, but of course they're going to be used as bombers. This is the one that almost was a breaking point for my family's relationship with Miyazaki because one day when I was editing Briar Patch and I was working really late, my wife took the girls to the place where they by where they sold the Blu-rays, this is before HBO Max, and came back with this one because she thought, quote, they were all for kids. <laughs> the Wind Rises is about a chain-smoking airplane designer for the Emperor in during World War II who befriends a German engineer voiced by Werner Herzog. So, you know, oh, and someone dies of tuberculosis. I'm going so that, that is, one. I'm going Wind Rises. So you're going grown up. That's yeah, the one let you me want. start there and I'll work my way back into childhood. Would you now like to... Tell us, the listeners, what you think Nausicaa Valley of the Wind is about, or perhaps Castle in the Sky. No, it's, we can save that for another one. Castle I will, in the I will, Sky sounds like a car service company in Brooklyn. I will watch, what's it called again? So you want The Wind Rises. The and wind I rises. noticed you chose the one with the least amount 
of whimsy and cats. The fewest cats. Um, I'm thinking about getting a cat, but I don't need one in a cartoon right now. Really? We should wrap it up there. Uh, we'll figure out a time when we're going to do this exchange, this cultural exchange. I, get, I think I have to assign you something. Although you, you and I like a lot of the same stuff. Well, we thought so until this weekend. <laughs> um, Andy, it was so good to talk to you. Obviously, we've got WandaVision coming. We've got a couple of shows coming. So we'll have, we'll have the regularly scheduled programming coming for you on Monday. Uh, everybody, take care of yourselves and stay safe. Yeah, stay safe, Francis. <laughs>